Good evening, everyone. There, there are more seats up the front for those coming in at the back. There, there are plenty of seats up here, sort of toward the middle. There's some more seats up the front for those that are just coming in. I'll just wait for everyone to come in from outside. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lisa Oldham. I'm the executive director here at the library. Um, and thanks to the generosity of so many people like you, we have the wonderful lineup of programs that we have here every week. And tonight we're delighted to have Mark come and talk about his phenomenal book. Uh, but first, could I please ask everyone to silence your phones and to get ready to be delighted by this extraordinary story that I think many of you have already read. We will have Q&A at the end. Sarah will come and I'll, I'll bring that to you now, Sarah. Sarah will be doing Q&A at the end and then Mark will be signing books again outside after the event. So without anything more, please welcome Mark Sullivan. <laughs> Yeah, I, I put a fresh one up. There we go. So if you can just hand it to Sarah at the end. Yeah. Turn this one. Okay. Okay, and Mark, just to show you, um, the mic volume is lower, a little bit louder. Okay. I mean, that is crazy. And uh, basically just so dance and I'm just saying. Yeah. That should be fine. Okay, great. Yeah, Ar arrows go forward. Great. Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, I love talking about Pino Lell and this story, so... This is a rare opportunity to me to come and do this in the East. I live out west in Montana and uh, see so many friends here. Um, I heard this story on the worst day of my life. Uh, my little brother and best friend had drunk himself to death. And uh, I had written a book that tanked in the United States. And uh, I was in this long, lingering business dispute that took me to the point of personal bankruptcy. And on a snowy Saturday afternoon in February of 2006, I was driving to a Costco of all places in Bozeman, Montana, and I was on a highway and I realized I was worth more dead than alive. And I seriously considered driving into a bridge abutment so my family could collect the money. Um, I didn't do it. I saw my wife and kids in the snow, um, and I managed to get into the Costco parking lot without killing myself, but I was as rattled as I've ever been in my entire life. And I put my head on a steering wheel and I begged God in the universe for a story. Something with purpose and something with meaning. And anybody who knows me, I'm a trained journalist, I'm a really skeptical guy. I, you know, I just, I went home, my wife had a stomach flu, she told me that I had to go to a dinner party. And I was just like, I'm not going to a dinner party. And she said, you, you have to. We've canceled three times. And I said, I, I'm not going. She goes, you've got to go. Just go for an hour and excuse yourself. So I go. And I'm sitting there at dinner, and a perfect stranger starts telling me this story. <laughs> three hours later. And I don't know about you, but asked and answered, you pay attention. And at first, I did not believe the story was real. Because I said, we would have heard this story. And they said, I think he's alive. And I was like, he's alive? How old is he? He's like 79. And so one thing leads to another. And two days later, I get him on the phone. I call him in Italy. And he speaks perfect English. He grew up in, with a British nanny. And he, um, he, went to, he went and lived in Beverly Hills later. And so he speaks great English. And I, I said, I really would like to come to Italy to talk to you. And he said, why would you want to do that? And I said, because you're a hero. And he said, no, I'm more of a coward. And instantly, every you know, story radar that I've got is going. And I know that I'm on to something. So I convinced him. And I go into my wife. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to take the last of our money and go to Italy and chase the 60. 
<laughs> and she has a 60 year of war story. And she was, to her great credit, she just goes, well, of course you are, you know. And uh, so I did. And um, I spent three weeks with him. And um, we went on this incredible emotional journey together uh, in which he was unearthing the past and I was listening to it. And along the way, I healed because I realized that my problems were like really small compared to the things that he could go through. And if he had gone through it, well, then I could keep going. And it was such a radical transformation in me that when I, when I left Italy, I vowed to tell the story to as many people as I could. And then that became this crazy idea of telling it to a billion people. And I just didn't expect it was going to take me 10 years to start the telling. Um, but that's what it took. It took me a decade of travel. And so I'm going to take you through um, some of the story without giving away, because I know a lot of you haven't read it. So there's certain things, and any questions that come, I'd prefer if there are, you know, if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. So let's try not to talk about those kinds of things. You can, you can refer to them euphemistically, and I'll reply euphemistically. Um, but basically, this is the story of Pino Lella, and he's 17 years old when the book starts. And um, it's the book I love the cover. Uh, this is a time when this is right as Mussolini's power is crumbling. They've, they've lost North Africa. He's brought his troops back across. And so we're in like early June of 1943. Pino Lella's just turned 17 on the 1st. And Mussolini's power is rotting away from him. And the Allies are about to begin a bombardment. And it's the first time that the Allies do a, a real carpet bombing. And what they're after is the industrial areas of northern Italy, because by this time, the Allies have destroyed the Ruhr Valley, which is where Hitler had all his big factories and industrial base. So they know that the only real big industrial base left to them is in Milan, Genoa, and Turin. So they begin to bomb in, in early 43. Um, and uh, before then, you have to understand a little bit about the Jews in Italy. Um, there are only about 40,000, 42,000. It's hard to get an, a correct number on it, and they're called the Ebri. And for the most part, they're completely accepted in Italy. I mean, they're, they're definitely anti-Semites in Italy. But for the most part, they've been there for 2,000 years. They've been there since Roman times. And the ghetto in Rome has been around for like 700 years. Um, and Mussolini never saw any purpose in persecuting the Jews. He would avoid it. He was always weaseling to get out of it, even though Hitler was constantly pushing him to do so. Um, uh, but this is him. This is the, the 6th of the, uh, May. So this is just before the book starts. Um, that's him and his thing. And this is where he lives. This is the center of Milan. Have any of you been to Milan? Okay, so you know right around the Duomo and the, um, the, the Galleria and La Scala and so this is all his neighborhood. This is where he grows up. He runs around in the streets there his whole childhood when he isn't in the mountains. Um, this, is, this is the top of the Duomo. Um, it's the cathedrals of Milan. So this is, the, this is the thing. This is the 500-year-old cathedral. It took 500 years to build. It's like 900 years old now. Um, and it sits right at the center of Milan. Uh, and they live in the fashion district, which is in um, San Babala. And so this is... Don McKelly, his father was sort of a passive guy. He was the business dude behind the scenes. Mom, Porgia, was the real dynamo behind the whole thing. She was the one who designed all the purses that they sold in their store. Um, this was Pino, just juice of Pino. It means little Joseph, but the Pino part stuck, even though he became a really big guy. Um, Domenico Mimo and then Francesca Chichi. And these, we don't, I don't have pictures. I've never been able to find the pictures of Uncle Albert and Aunt Greta. And they own a leather goods store. And it's all within like about, you know, two blocks of each other in San Babala. Um, the, as I said, the dad was kind of passive. He's an accountant. He had a fascist card. But you basically couldn't be in business without belonging to the fascist party. Um, his big love was m music. He liked to play the violin. His greatest dream was to play in the orchestra La Scala. But he was a little sketchy on it, you know, because he would let go of the squall and he never had it. But his, he was so enthralled by musicians that he brought them to the house. They were, they were a part of the Lella family. And that's Pino, by the way, on the left with his little piano. Um, there's Porgia. Her brothers were 
the Bugatti um, dealers in Milan, uh, among other things. There's the luggage shop, uh, for those of you who've read the book. Um, this becomes a cent. This is actually in the back. This is where the factory was. You can see the, the things they're building. And um, out front would be the, the, the shop that faced uh, Via Mota Napoleone in San Babola. Um, it just shows some of the, the way that this attacks. But anyway, the, the, the bombing of Milan begins in June of 43, and it's relentless. And for Pino, it begins in a theater. He's watching this movie, You Were Never Lovelier, and when the bombardment starts, and the, bo the theater gets hit, and they barely get out, and they run towards the only thing that's lit in the city. This is the beginning of a blackout that goes for almost two years. And by now, the cathedral windows have been removed. They've been put with cardboard. The Galleria, for those of you who've been there, it's the first indoor shopping mall. The glass has been removed from the superstructure. And they have trained lights at Cardinal Schuster's behest on the cathedral so that they, the allies won't bomb the cathedral. Uh, there's more bombs coming out. They, now, Milan loses about a third of the city during the bombardment over the course of about 15, 17 months. Um, this is some of the destruction. By, this, by the time it gets to July, the Allies have invaded Sicily and they're threatening to come onto the boot. Um, and Milan is taking terrible punishment. This is the, the worst bombing that takes place in late July. That's the Galleria. It gets hit. La Scala gets hit. The church where the Last Supper gets hit, but miraculously, the painting doesn't get destroyed. Um, by this time, Mussolini's starting to lose. I love this. Every time I see it, I just die laughing. I, I, I had this picture. Anytime I wrote him, I had this picture up on my computer. Because he was gradually losing his mind during the whole time. Um, and, but what happens is by the, by the middle or so of July, the king of Italy, Emmanuel III, realizes that they're going to lose, right? And if Mussolini keeps this, a lot of Italians are going to die needlessly. So he arrests them, and he throws them in this place. It's a fortress up on top of Grand Sasso Mountain, which is a flat-top mountain in the Apennines north of Rome. And Hitler gets enraged that they've arrested him and thrown him there. So he orders his uh, most trusted assassin, a guy named Igor Sikorsky, to lead a commando group. It's true. Uh, that's Sikorsky right there, uh, right there next to it. That's, that's Mussolini. That's Sikorsky as they're bringing him out of the fortress. And um, Sikorsky brings in like seven gliders, and they land on this flat top mountain. And then they bring in, a, and they're, these are the actual commandos bringing Mussolini out. They're bringing him across the mountain, and they fly him. And the plane that almost, that takes him out, almost doesn't make it. It dives off the mountain. It can't get air, and finally it comes up. And he gets him to Hitler. And so they, they announce that they're going to fight to the death. And right around this time, Hitler realizes that this is the soft, what, what Churchill called the soft underbelly of Europe. And he acts to fortify it. And he sends down massive number of divisions into Italy uh, during the summer. It keeps building that whole summer more and more. Um, Italy surrenders, this is what happens to the south, and we get a divided country roughly around this time. So the Allies are invading. The first things the Italians do in the south is they give up, and they join the fight because most of the people in the army, they have no, you know, this was Mussolini's grand passion was to go off and create an, an empire in Ethiopia and places like that. And they, you know, and they got their butts kicked, and so they come back, and they're in no mood for war, and they, they uh, Retire. So all of southern Italy gets invaded by the 8th Army, and Hitler backs Mussolini in this puppet government called Salo, and the, the, the Republic of Salo, and they have a, a place, he lives in a villa on Lake Garda in northern Italy, um, but he's basically a puppet. He's got no power whatsoever. So by this point, the, as, as this is going on, and there's more, the bombardment is near constant, and the Germans are coming, and the Germans are not stupid, and they know that the the only place that's not getting bombed heavily is right around the Duomo. Even though places got hit by wayward bombs, so they pack in there. They put their headquarters there. The, the Gestapo is there. Um, and there are panzer tanks that sit on the Duomo for like two and a half years. Um, this is Walter Ralph. He's the head of the uh, SS in northern Italy. Uh, he's a character in there. Um, this guy will eventually, uh, they believe he killed over 100,000 people. 
uh, with a portable gas chamber that he designed. And another 380,000 died because of the design. And uh, he is a constant uh, presence in that luggage shop. He would go there and buy stuff for his girlfriends. This is the former Hotel Main. It no longer exists. This is a picture from when I did my initial research. This is where the first big massacre took place in Italy. Um, there were, you, you can hear different reports, anywhere between 38 and 50 Jews living in this hotel getting ready to stage to get out of the country if they have to. And so the Germans in, invade and declare on, this, on the 8th of September, 1943, this thing, and they immediately start going after the Jews. This is the first big massacre. They come here, they find the 50. There's one girl, her name is Becky Bihar. She's out riding a bike, and they come, and Ralph orders his men up there. They come, they take the 50 Jews out right here, and you can't see it, but there's a lake right behind it, Lake Maggiore, and they... they order them into the water and they machine gun them in the water. And the girl's riding down the, the coast and she sees this. And she's freaking out, going for her parents and a Catholic woman comes and grabs her and pulls her into the house. And this is right around this time, all over northern Italy, Catholics are beginning to rise up to help Jews. So the big, the big one is, uh, and this, this is, I'll show you some pictures. This is in Rome actually. Um, this is the, the Rome ghetto, Milan, they pack them on. There are, if, for those of you who have read the book, this is Platform 21. That's the red cattle car. Um, this is at, at Auschwitz. Uh, these are Italian Jews at Auschwitz. The bombing continues, and um, a number of things start to happen. Pino's father sends his younger brother, who's 15, to the mountains to a place called Casal Pina, which is run by this courageous priest named Father Ray. And um, the reason they sent him up there is that the boys would go up there for like a month, seven weeks during the summer, and they would learn to climb. And they would climb around the mountains. And in the winter, he'd go up there and he'd teach them to ski. And it was, you know, backcountry skiing. They would climb into areas. It's now a ski area. You can go ski it. Um, but this is the area, for, for those of you who know anything about Italy, this is um, Lake Como right here. Or actually, Lake Como right here. And that's Medesimo. And this is where the boys' school was. And I'll have better pictures of it in a sec. Um, that's it. That's the current school. And you can see it's a pretty dramatic setting. And this is well up the side of the mountain. So right behind the school, it dives off close to 3,000 feet to the bottom in Campo del Chino. And the school is back there. And of course, it was much, more, much smaller. It's a hotel now. Um, but it's run by this guy, Don Luigi Ray, who started it as a boys' camp because he believed that boys needed a lot of exercise and challenge, and he would bring them into the mountains and, and teach them to climb with people. And um, so Pino had been going there for years. And so this guy, the guy on the right, his name is Barbareski, and he's a seminarian as the book starts. And he's up at Casal Pina. He's sent up there by uh, Cardinal Schuster, who knows Father Ray. And Barbareski, uh, in late, in, well, sorry, late August, early September, Barbaresky wasn't quite sure of the exact date, but there are the first Jewish refugees get to Casalpina. And Barbaresky and Father Ray come up with this idea that they're going to take all the boys who were there at the time on a picnic hike. And so like 30 people go out and they climb the mountain. You know, it's, it's beautiful out. It's not snowy. And they get down to this place, uh, uh, Valdele, and they get, which is, it means valley of the lake. It's a high alpine lake area. And they go into the back and behind that lake there's a triangle of land. And in that triangle, on both sides of the triangle is Switzerland. And it's in the woods. So 30 go up and 26 come back. And they go into Switzerland. And so that's the start of it. And so Barbaresky comes up with this idea that they are going to rescue Italy's Jews. And they're going to get them out through various routes in the north over mountain, remote mountain passes into Switzerland. And so Barbaresky goes back into Milan and he becomes the forger. So he forges all the documents, and we're talking about 3,000 of them uh, the, over the course of the time that they do it. Um, this is the angel step. For those of you who've read the book, um, I don't want to, I keep blinding myself with this thing, but Casalpino would be down here. They would have come all the way down here, and they go up through there. That's the easy way. That's the easy way. 
uh, so another peak it gives you, there's the lake. There's the triangle. There's the back side of the lake. This is Switzerland. Comes back in here to the triangle. This is where they went through. Um, if you were caught helping Jews escape, you were immediately executed. So at this point, uh, Cardinal Schuster, who's the Cardinal of Milan, he tells Father Ray with Barbareski that they're going to start moving the Jews out. And um, they do. Uh, and Barbareski forms Oscar. And it means scouts working to aid refugees. And what he does is he allies himself with these guys called the um, Aguiles Randages. It means the wandering eagles. It's their equivalent of the Boy Scouts. And the Boy Scouts have been um, uh, outlawed under Mussolini, but they still existed in secret. And they were in the mountains, you know, climbing and doing all this stuff, but they were also in the city. And so the Boy Scouts become Barbareski's couriers on bicycles. At one point, this book was 850 pages long. <laughs> and it really was. It was just a monster, and it had to be cut. So a lot of this stuff like, ended up on the early cutting room floor. We've restored just this part, just describing it, because so many people are like, how did that work? So we, we put it back in, in in the forthcoming hardcover. But again, these were like the Boy Scouts, and they were up in these remote areas, and they knew the mountains. Uh, so they start. And um, the, the boys, the, the biggest number of them, it's always hard, the biggest number of them go out through here. This very remote thing, I have a better picture of it in a second. And um, Kempel Docino's here in Medesimo. So there's two routes out, and Barbareski's moving them, and they would come to Medesimo, uh, and then they would end up, Here's actual pictures of some of the, the escapers you know, as they're going up over the mountains. Um, so they, they came to Val, Val Viacena, and then they went up the Splugen drainage, which is where Medesimo is. At first, they took them right over the Splugen Pass, but then the Germans got wise, and they had to be getting them to take them up over a thing called the Gropera, which was right above the school. And it's, it's a big hunk of rock. Um, yeah, there's the Gropera. This is the mountain itself. Yeah, and they would come up from there. So these are the actual escape routes. Um, this is an actual map of what is now Ascaria. So you have Campo Dacino, Casalpina here. That's the easy way. This was the north way, which was a little bit more difficult. And this was the nasty one, right up the spine of the mountain. And they had to use that, unfortunately, in the dead of winter because it was the only place that the snow was shallow enough for them to get footing. But remember what happens is the Pinot gets up there. He gets sent up there in September, shortly after Barbareski goes down, and Father Ray starts training him because he hasn't been in the mountains. And he sends him on all these routes multiple times. And they begin to establish, uh, there's Milo Lella, uh, his little brother in, at Casalpina. That's Pinot on the right with the glasses on, and that's, that's the actual Casalpina at the time down there. Those are two refugees who actually knew how to ski. Most of them did not. They knew nothing. Uh, and he had to take urban refugees into very difficult situations over the top of, of this Gropera in there. That's Pino himself. Uh, let me see if we can get him to go. He's basically showing me the route, but you can see behind how far it drops. He's standing on the site of the chapel, for those of you who uh, have read the book, uh, which is where they used to signal. Um, that's the north routes. These are actual photographs, and I did these routes. I climbed them you know, or skied them. So this is another one. This will give you a sense of how um, steep it is. Oh, what happened? So that's, the, that's Casalpina down there. I'm about halfway up the slope at this point. You see the kind, now that's up. They go up that spine. They climb all the way up it. They get to that poke. They keep going. They get all the way up there. Now I'm going to take you up. Now we're looking down. That's what they just came up. Right? And then they make it off here. There's the lake. There's the corner, around the corner in Switzerland. 
That, for those of you who remember the violinist, that's where she went down, right on his back. Um, at, the first time I meet Pino Lello, I get out of in Malpensa Airport, and he's just a really beautiful guy, and very gracious and nice. And we get in this little um, Citroen, and I have no idea what's about to happen. And we get we get out onto the you know like their equivalent of an interstate, their autobahn, and all of a sudden we're like cranking through traffic. I mean, it just I'd never been in a car with anybody who was that brilliant a driver. And this is essential to understand because this man, who becomes the greatest race car driver of all time, teaches him to drive. So, and April 44, they've been leading escapes all that winter, and the SS comes. And they, they went, and they, they had heard that Jews were being moved through there. And um, Ralph comes, and they lo they're looking for Jews, or actual Jews, at Casalpina, and they, Pino comes up with this crazy idea and they take the Jews and they bring them into the spruce groves behind the, the school and they have them climb trees, but there's snow all over the ground, so they know they'll track them, so they drive oxen into the trees to stomp down all the, the footprints so no one knows they're there, which I, I always thought that was like completely brilliant. But. So anyway, it gets to be the spring of 44 and all of a sudden he gets a message that his parents want him to come back to Milan because he's about to turn 18. And they're afraid that if he, get, if he turns 18, he'll be conscripted into the Italian army and he'll have one of two things. He'll have to go fight the Allies, in which he could die, or he could be sent to the Russian front, in which he could die. And they just said, they came up with this idea based on these posters, which were around in Italy in 41, 42, 43. And what it is, is it's this thing, the organization tote, and it's the least understood part of the Nazi war machine. You never hear about it. But it was the combination of like the Army Corps of Engineers crossed with the Quartermaster's Corps. So anything that had to do with war that wasn't a soldier or an officer came out of these guys. They built the bombs. They built the bullets. They built the cannons. They built the tanks. They built everything. They built the concentration camps. In fact, a lot of concentration camps, if you see pictures from the exterior, they have this thing, OT on them. It meant organization tote, and they were camouflaged as, quote, work camps. So the organization tote is the least understood part of the Nazi war machine. But believe it or not, at one point, there were as many as 12 million people in the organization, most of them slaves. You ask yourself, how did, I, I never really thought about this before I started working on this book, but how did the Germans build all these fortifications? The entire western wall of France, the southern, all the, everything, pillboxes, everything, they built it the same way Pharaoh did. You take slaves, you put them to work, you have instant manpower. So what would happen is they would invade a country, they would go after the Jews, and then every able-bodied man over about the age of 14 or 15 was enslaved and shipped off. And it happened everywhere. They walked around. They, many of them wore these gray suits. Um, they built tanks. They built tank traps. Uh, they are training. Those guys who were actual troops. And through a series of crazy circumstances, he doesn't want to go in, but his parents force him to. They believe it's the only way he'll be able to outlive the war. And so he goes and he trains to be this guy. And all they did was guard train stations and things of this nature. Anywhere there was a supply route, they would be the soldiers guarding it. So he goes into the um, train station in Modena, and the third night he's there, it's bombed, and he gets hit. And he gets knocked out cold, and he almost has his right index finger cut off. And he wakes up in a German hospital, and they sewed his fingers back on. And after a few days, because he had a massive concussion, they send him home to recuperate for 10 days. He goes home. He's walking in the street, and there's a, a Nazi general's staff car parked in front of his uncle's luggage store. And the hood's up. And Pino, because he's been trained by Mario, um, understands all about engines, and the guy can't get the thing started. And he gets under there and fires it up. And when he slams the lid down, there's a Nazi general standing right there. This man, Hans Leiers. Hans Leiers is the second most powerful person in general, I'm sorry, the 
the second most powerful Nazi in Italy, and hardly anybody's ever heard of him. He ran the organization tout, and he was what was called a plenipotentiary, which meant that he had the absolute authority of a Reich minister. In this case, it would have been Albert Speer, who was Hitler's architect, that he supposedly worked directly for. And his job was to provide anything that the field marshals needed to fight the war. So if they needed parts, he got them. If they needed vehicles, he got them. If they needed food, he stole it. That was his job, was to supply an army. For those of you who haven't been in the military, if you study most military campaigns, the reason armies lose is their supply lines dwindle. They can't get enough to keep fighting. And that's what this man's job was to do. So Pino becomes his driver. And his uncle snaps because the general realizes he can fix vehicles and he can drive them. And his father, I mean, his uncle snaps because he realizes that Pino can go everywhere the general goes. And what the general sees, Pino sees. And they have a spy inside the German high command. They have a, a, a radio um, that looked just like this. Uh, he had described it to me. And then I found this picture in the US um, National Archives from the OSS. And it was, like, it was dead on the way he described it with the false bottom. And you can see it, see how it opens up. Um, but they had one, and his uncle uh, had one. There was a guy named Baca who was their transmitter. And so wherever Pino went uh, with the general, he would keep note of it on maps. And he would keep track of pillboxes and, and all fortifications, et cetera. Um, and again, like the pharaohs before him, he built this fortification using slaves. Uh, these are propaganda pictures from the OT trying to show you that how well they're being fed. I mean, they look like jolly. And in fact, they were more like skeletons. Um, these, are the kind of, these are actual pictures of them building fortifications in Italy. Um, these are the kind of things they do. They would pop the, if a tank got busted up, they'd pop the top out of it. They'd dig a hole. They'd put a turret, and it, they'd have a you know, embedded cannon. Um, so as this is going on, the battle for Italy is occurring, and the fifth is landed. They take Rome in, in early of, uh, right around the time that Pino's meeting the general, and everything grinds to a halt because just before they took Rome, um, Eisenhower orders, I can't remember, it's four or five or six divisions out of Italy and moves them to the south of France to fight north, and the whole momentum grinds to a halt. They only make it 17 miles north of Rome. And uh, these are the battle lines. Uh, this is Monte Cassino. So these, every single battle line was built by layers, overseen by layers. He had different generals under him, but he basically oversaw. So he knew where all the battle lines, he knew where the good stuff was, he knew where the bad stuff was. Fighting through Italy was some of the fiercest of the war. The Battle of Monte Cassino has been compared to Iwo Jima. It lasted like nine months. Um, and it was brutal, and it was because the Germans held the high ground uh, in that monastery, and the the, uh, the Allies had to bombard it into rubble in order to c press through, which they did, and they took Rome, and then D-Day happens, and everything grinds down. So layers used as many as 15,000 that I've been able to document slaves to build the Gothic line, which is north, and that becomes the point at which the Allies stop in the late summer, early fall of 44. Uh, and the Gray Men, which is what Pino would call the slaves, they built like you know, 2,000 fortified machine guns, nests, casements, everything, all the way across, one side to the other. And as, these are some of the fortifications. There's the, uh, the 10th Mountain Division of the U.S. Army. Uh, you'll see the mules. We talk, I talk about the mules. Mules pulled artillery for both sides through Italy, up these like, crazy mountain passes. And so the winter of 44, 45 hits, and it's one of the most brutal on record. And everybody's suffering, Germans and allies. Um, during this time, I, I just want to back up so you understand. Pino, and I'm not going to talk about this much because it's a, it's a spoiler, but... Pino uh, meets the maid of the general's mistress, Dolly, and he falls in love with her. And she, because no one knows that he's a spy except for his uncle, aunt, and him, and the radio operator. And so his own brother believes he's gone Nazi. Uh, all his friends believe he's gone Nazi. And it's a terrible time for him because he can't tell them because they, they explain to him that if you tell anybody, 
they talk, you die. So let's keep it to the absolute minimum while we're doing this. And you know, here's this 17 year old. He's now he's gone. He's now 18 in this in the, at this point, and he's totally isolated. And she's older. She's six years older than him. She's a widow, and he falls in love with her. And and that's all about all I'm going to say for right now. But um, the Germans on the Gothic line. Finally, they break through in the spring of 45, and um, Mussolini is going into madness, and all of Italy descends into this anarchy. Like they're incredibly to this day embarrassed about it. That's why most Italians don't talk about the war if they experienced it because of this absolutely crazy revenge anarchy that went on in the last days of the war. Um, so the last we're getting near the, the end of the war and it's April 25th, 45. Uh, Pino finally arrests Lairs, delivers him to the partisan, and this is the night that the uprising happens in Milan. And for the first time in two years, the lights go on, which I was always, that, that whole concept completely blew me away. Um, and in come the partisans. They come marching into the city. Uh, women fought, you know, they were pretty bad, Tommy guns, et cetera. And they took uh, collaborators, uh, they painted them, uh, you know, wrote things on their faces, and executed them. In the last days of the war, right from the uprising until about 10 days afterwards, based on the estimates I've seen, as many as 53,000 people were executed in reprisal killings throughout northern Italy. In Milan, there was anywhere between 500 to 1,000 a night were being found dead in the streets. They took them to the cemetery, they laid them out. Um, Mussolini, this is his last day. You can see the guy's lost like 70 pounds at this point. Um, and he ends up here. He ends up hanging upside down in the Esso station in the Piazzella Loretto. Uh, and he, there's a desecration that goes on. It's one of the most horrific things I've ever researched or tried to write about. And the, the mob comes out and they basically almost tear the bodies apart because they're so furious at what's happened to them. Um, for those of you who read the book, this is where the book climaxes in the Cathedrals of God. These are the Dolomite Alps uh, on the way up into Austria. So how many were saved? Well, in the Val Cordera, which is that big main route that I showed you north, and through Oscar and the Aquila Randaji, 2,166 people, including a woman named, a man named Indro Montanelli, who was a famous Jewish uh, a journalist who went out that way. And then uh, in Mota Valdele, Father Ray, Oscar, and the boys of Casalpina, including Pino, um, they took hundreds of Jews, down pilots, uh, and other refugees trying to escape the brutality in Italy. Um, this is Don Luigi Ray's uh, pages in The Righteous of Italy. Um, I love this story. This is Father Ray's tomb. No one knows where the gold came from to build that. And it was said to be, to be given by all the people that he saved, but no one knows. And that's what Barbaresky, he goes, no one really knows. Um, that's Barbaresky. Uh, when I interview him, he's still alive. He's 95. Yeah, there he is. That's his you know, certificate of, of uh, being righteous of Italy. Um, that's the Mazen, that's what Casalpino looked like when I was there. Uh, that's Hans Layers later in life. That's his house. That's his death notice. That's the church he built. And that's me and Pino in April 2006. That's me at the Nazi war archives. That is Cardinal Schuster's tomb below the altar. And that's the proudest. So this is the proudest day of my life. Yeah. It's, it's a funny thing. The, the last thing I'll say is that, that this day made me realize that the worst day of your life can really be one of your best. <laughs>